with us today, Dr. Jared Roll, and he is going to be speaking to us on Jordan Stormy Banks, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, and the 1939 roadside demonstration in Southeast Missouri. And uh, we've been interested in this for a long time because since we opened our Southern Tenant Farmers Museum in 2006, a lot of people see our pictures of this roadside demonstration and they ask, well, what's that all about and how does it connect with the Southern Tenant Farmers Union? And so that led to the invitation to bring in the expert who can tell us all about it. So uh, Dr. Roll is originally from Mount Vernon, Missouri, and he's currently the Associate Professor of History at Ole Miss. Uh, He's just been there since 2014 because before that he spent seven years at the University of Sussex in Brighton, England. Uh, his master in si master's in science and his doctoral degrees are from Northwestern University. And his research and writing there focused on the intersection of race, work, and protest in the political economy of rural America. Uh, he's the author of a couple of books, uh, including the most three. One of them is Spirit of Rebellion, which I understand we don't have copies here for people to purchase, but I bet if you go online and get one, we could get him to sign it's for you. Available from all reputable <laughs> <laughs> Spirit of Rebellion. And, and, and then his most recent uh, co-authored, The Gospel of the Working Class, which won the H.L. Mitchell Award from the Southern Historical Association. And most of you know that H.L. Mitchell was one of the founders of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. Uh, he's purchased, he purchased, you <laughs> see, I'm purchasing your books. Uh, he's also published extensively in journals such as the Journal of uh, Southern History, Religion and American Culture, Labor History, Southern Spaces, Radical History View, and most recently, Labor Studies in Working Class History of the Americas. Uh, he was also a research fellow at the Shelby Cullum Davis Center for Historical Studies at Princeton University. So we are very delighted that Dr. Roll has joined us today on uh, not the best of all days, but at least it didn't snow and ice you in. So we're glad to have you, Dr. Roll. Thank you. Um, before I get started with the talk, I'd just like to extend my thanks to Linda Hinton, the terrific staff at the Southern Tenant Farmers Museum, especially Brian Pierce, who's done such a wonderful job of organizing this event. I thank you very much, and it's truly an honor to be here. Um, and now for a bit of just sort of shameless self-promotion, I'm going to just pass these books around. These are my copies, so please don't, don't steal them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the material, both of these books deal with, in a fundamental way, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, the rise of agrarian unionism in Arkansas and Southeast Missouri in the 1930s, and its legacy going forward in the 1940s. Um, so my talk will draw upon both of these books today, focusing in on particular elements. Uh, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union involvement with the 1939 roadside demonstration, but particularly the role of African American women in the Union and in the roadside demonstration. Uh, this is not only Black History Month, but next month is Women's History Month. So we're trying to address both of those here today. Um, the drive up from Oxford uh, traverses the great cotton growing regions of the United States historically. Crossing over from Memphis into Arkansas, entering the Arkansas lowlands, always struck by the landscape. It's flat. In the winter, the trees are leafless. You can see great expanses. Um, and I want to take us back. Well, I want you to have that landscape in your mind as we start to think about the roadside demonstration, because in a very similar landscape, January 1939, just over 77 years ago, more than 1,500 people, about three quarters of them African American, set up encampments on the sides of highways 60 and 61 in the southeast Missouri boot heel, extending east from Sykeston to Charleston and Wyatt, 
along Highway 60, and south from Sykeston to Hayti, down near the Arkansas border along Highway 61. They set up encampments as families, as mothers, fathers, children, grandparents. They brought with them, as you can see in this photograph taken from one of the roadside encampments, tables, chairs, pots and pans, corn shuck mattresses, Bibles, meager possessions, but everything that they own in the world, they carry with them to the roadsides. The preceding week, landlords in the Missouri boot heel, that is landowners who let their land out to tenant farmers and sharecroppers, had issued eviction notices to hundreds of sharecropping families on the area's expansive cotton farms. By 1939, this process had been underway for several years. Southern cotton planters were in the process of replacing the tenancy system. That is where a family worked a plot of land in exchange generally for a share of the crop, sharecropping. Replacing that tenancy system, which had existed since really the 1870s, replacing it with a new system where the farm work was done by casual wage laborers who, laborers who no longer lived on the land, but instead were expected to live in towns and work in the seasonal cotton, uh, the, the, in seasonal cotton labor. Chopping cotton, picking cotton being the, the two primary seasonal, um, seasons with primary demand for cotton labor. Replacing the tenancy system with wage labor who would work in those seasons, uh, but also their farms would run with tractors and cultivators. There's a process of casualizing the labor system, but also mechanizing the labor system. In the process, removing families who had spent their lives living on the land as farmers, whose parents, whose grandparents, had spent their lives living on the land as farmers, removing those people from the land, moving them into area towns. Area towns where they would have unknown futures. This was a revolutionary transformation in the fundamental political economy of Southern cotton. And in 1939, it's reaching its apex, right, as landlords are issuing eviction notices and moving people off the land. They were able to do this, and they were encouraged to do this in the 1930s because they were taking advantage of New Deal measures passed by the administration of President Franklin Roosevelt that created money incentives for this transformation. Through their congressional representatives, who, by nature of the Democratic Party in the South, exerted almost total control over the most powerful congressional committees. Through those representatives, cotton planters were able to craft legislation meant to raise cotton prices, uh, which had fallen to disastrously low levels, craft legislation to pay them to replace tenant farmers and sharecroppers with tractors and casualties. So this is a, a revolution that's not just being done by planters, but it's being done within the architecture of New Deal policy. Right? Policy that's meant to alleviate the worst aspects of the Depression. In, in, in Southern cotton, that is, it's meant to raise the price of cotton. The evictions, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in a minute. The eviction started in 1935. That's the first year where southern planters are moving tenant farmers off of the land in large numbers. And it grew larger each year until 1939, when the families on the roadsides decided to take a stand. We don't know whether this will do us any good, Will Jones, one of the roadside demonstrators, said that January. Quote, but it will show people what we were up against. And it worked. Within days, 
Newspapers carried word of the protest nationwide. The White House took notice. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt wrote about the protest in her weekly newspaper column, My Day, it was called. President Roosevelt himself, the head of the New Deal in the 1930s seen as a savior of the forgotten Americans, as he called them. He wrote to his Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace, in a private memo, and it's important that it's private, because Roosevelt was famous for making people, or for leading people to believe that he agreed with what they said and he was going to help them. This is a private memo to the Secretary of Agriculture from the President of the United States saying, quote, we need to do everything within our power to assist the families of the sharecroppers, farm tenants, and farm laborers in southern Missouri who went out on the road. The President of the United States, private memo to Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace. If you're looking to the two most powerful people in terms of 1930s New Deal legislation concerning agriculture, it's these two men. Roosevelt says we need to do everything within our power to help those who went out on the road. It would have been hard to imagine a better outcome for this demonstration to so quickly capture national attention, so quickly capture the support and sympathy of the most powerful people in the United States, Roosevelt himself. Back in southeast Missouri, the cotton planters, local government officials, state government officials, ask themselves, how did they do it? Right here we have, among the poorest people in the United States, among those who have the least power, here they are, in a, in a roadside demonstration, risking their lives, their meager belongings, everything, in a tremendous gamble to capture national attention around this issue, and they did it. How did they do it? It's almost unthinkable. Some blamed the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, a union of tenant farmers, sharecroppers, and casual farm laborers founded near Taranza. Am I saying that right? I'm from southern Missouri, but the, the dialect changes very quickly when you get over, over, over the Missouri line, especially as you go west from the Ozarks. The Ozarks are different. Founded in 1934 precisely to protest against planter abuse, but maybe abuse isn't the, the right word because they're crafting the New Deal legislation. They're not abusing it. They're, it it's working the way they design it to. Southern Tenant Farmers Union is founded primarily to protest this injustice of New Deal policy. Most of the families on the roadsides in southeast Missouri in 1939 belonged to or were members of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. But for casual observers and, and deeply interested observers in southeast Missouri, Blaming it on the Southern Tenant Farmers Union really didn't answer the question of how they did it. When observers said the Southern Tenant Farmers Union was behind it, what they really meant that were that political radicals were behind the Southern Tenant Farmers Union and thus behind the demonstration. Socialists, communists, the Red Menace. This is the only way that powerful people in southeast Missouri could understand how sharecroppers could mount such a successful protest. That it had to be the hand and design of radical agitators, outside agitators from New York City, or even Moscow. Even worse. There's not much difference in their mind in the 1930s in New York City and Moscow. <laughs> Maybe not even today. <laughs> and to some extent, that could look true. The Southern Tenant Farmers Union was founded with the support of the Socialist Party. H.L. Mitchell, Clay East were both socialists. Norman Thomas and the National Socialist Party 
had provided them with startup funds in 1934 to found the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. So there's a way that that could have been true. Particularly if you're not really thinking very hard about it, paying close attention to what was going on. So surely, they said, there must be these so-called alien ideologies at work here. The only way to explain it. I'm going to address this a little bit more a little bit. Um, where this blame really focused was on one individual, uh, a man named Owen Whitfield. He was an African-American preacher, a Baptist preacher, a cotton farmer, and an STFU member since 1936. Uh, he had quickly risen to the post of vice president of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. He's a very successful organizer for the union in southeast Missouri. Area commentators argued that Whitfield, the tool of the red menace, the cat's paw of the communist menace, was controlling the protesters at will, that he alone had summoned them out in this protest, but he and himself a kind of stalking agent of the Communist Party. But again, in this way of thinking about it, the, the active agents were always white radicals from somewhere else, outsiders, alien ideologies. In arguing this way, in understanding the demonstration this way, observers concluded that the people on the roadsides themselves, the mothers, fathers, grandparents, with their children, that they could not have done this on their own. That music almost beautifully timed set a, <laughs> set a romantic scene like Ken Burns here. Happy to oblige. This is, this is great. Means I strike up the, the violin. So this argument includes that the people on the roadsides actually have very little to do with the motivations of the demonstration, the, the design of the demonstration, or crafting its goals. And this, I think, is becoming clear in my argument, is totally wrong. It's a totally incorrect way to think about the roadside demonstration. My talk today will, will explore the deep local roots of the demonstration, situated amid the lives, experiences, and thoughts of the people who went to the roadsides themselves. Although some white farmers did take part, about one-fourth of the 1,500 protesters were white, the vast majority were African American. They predominated in the organizations that helped create this roadside demonstration, which was not the design of radical thinkers, not the design of the feared outside agitator, or even of the union officials. It was not even the design of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union itself. Again, although the demonstration People in the demonstration were members of the union. H.L. Mitchell, the union's national leadership, did not know it was going to happen. It was organized, orchestrated, without their knowledge. And so the 1939 demonstration is best understood as a reflection of the people who were involved in it, of their long-held aspirations for secure, stable lives on the land as farmers, and as the product of a dense web of kinship and community networks that they had nurtured in Southeast Missouri for more than a generation. And it was women, in particular, who were the key connectors in these networks, and indeed the key leaders in the union movement that led up to the demonstration and in the demonstration itself. The people who went to the roadsides did so in part to defend a way of life threatened with extinction, threatened by this revolutionary transformation in the political economy of cotton. But they also went to the roadsides to imagine a better future. It's not just looking to the past 
and trying to resurrect a past that's gone, but it's about imagining a new future, a better future for themselves, and more importantly, for their children. So I'm going to return to that lowland landscape. Flat, sweeping fields, few trees. I think there are more trees now than there were then. Clear-cut acreages. You can see for miles. It's not like that in Southeast Missouri. Uh, as recently as 1910, the area known as the Boot Heel, still covered in swamps, ancient old growth forests. It's the last section of the Mississippi River's alluvial valley to be developed into agricultural land, being developed a decade, maybe two decades later than northeastern Arkansas is developed, but a very similar process. Timber companies came first, targeting these massive trees right, that had grown from time immemorial. Once the timber was cut, the, the stump-filled, swampy remains uh, were drained. Some retained by timber companies, some acreages sold for rather low amounts to uh, uh, aspiring planters, aspiring <coughs> farmers. And once those swamps were drained by elaborate systems of ditches, right? we know the ditches well, what lay beneath the swamps for, for literally millennia being replenished by alluvial deposits with some of the richest soil in North America, anywhere in the world at that point, where, where you can raise corn that I have pictures of a woman standing on a horse's back and the corn stalks are above her head astoundingly rich land. In southeast Missouri, landowners first tried to cultivate corn and wheat in the 1910s. But very rapidly in the 1920s, they switched to cotton, primarily as a, as a better cash crop um, and better suited to this deep, rich alluvial soil that in some places produces as much as two bales of cotton per acre which is a kind of astounding uh, figure of production, and particularly looking at the older cotton regions, which by the 1920s are depleted and producing far less than one bale per acre. This dramatic transformation, here we have the boot heel, we have the sunken swamp lands. That's about 1910, 1912. That's before the ditches went in that drained those swamp lands. Uh, but that transformation of swampy timberland to rich farmland attracted thousands of migrants from the surrounding countryside. White migrants looking for a new star, but particularly African-American migrants who came from Mississippi, Tennessee, and yes, Arkansas, looking for a, a, an, a, an opportunity, maybe a last opportunity, to seize land ownership, right, to own their own farm. Between 1920 and 1925, 15,000 African Americans migrated to Southeast Missouri, um, first becoming tenants, but doing so with the aim, the explicit aim of achieving land ownership, what they believed at the time to be the primary basis for independence, autonomy, and security, land ownership. According to reports in the 1920s, these people were, quote, well-dressed, and every one of them self-sustaining and with bank accounts. They were, quote, reliable and experienced cotton-growing people who had been good citizens in their communities. They were thrifty and dependable. These are not, uh, we, we shouldn't imagine impoverished refugees fleeing uh, terrible situations, but some of the most talented cotton growing families in the South, families that owned property, who had bank accounts, who were uh, successful in many ways. Right? On the verge of making the step from landlessness to land ownership. They left places like Arkansas and Mississippi where they said they'd been oppressed 
politically, certainly by Jim Crow, but also economically, cheated out of the full, their full reward of their labor by duplicitous landowners. Uh, one migrant uh, in Sykeston informed the newspaper editor in 1923 that he moved from Arkansas because, quote, he could not make a living there. He wanted to show his new neighbors in the boot heel that he was, quote, a good farmer and a good citizen. And these migrants established strong rural communities in the 1920s, emphasizing self-sufficiency, family ties, family working together on the farm, and the support of neighbors. These communities were led politically and economically in the 1920s by men. These are male-dominated communities in the 1920s, emphasizing land ownership, emphasizing paternal control over family labor and community politics. Right? And land ownership is key to this in the 1920s. Some of them acquired land, not most. Right? Many did not, most did not. But they did add to their property holdings. They bought mules, they bought tools, they bought their own cars, they bought their own trucks, all key assets in the aspirational climb toward land ownership. These things allowed them to negotiate more favorable terms with landlords as tenants um, and to escape sharecropping itself, to move up into the next rung of agricultural labor. And this worked for a while in the 1920s. But then a series of disasters struck. The Mississippi River flood of 1927 wet seasons 1928 and 1929, and then a punishing drought in 1930 and 1931 decimated these communities, decimated crops, decimated livestock, decimated gardens, and quickly eroded all that they had, they had built in the 1920s. And of course, the man-made disaster of the Great Depression heaped additional misery and complications upon these natural disasters. Cotton prices plummeted to the lowest levels ever. By 1932, about 4.2 cents per lent pound. As recently as 1918, 1920, or 19, cotton had sold for 38, 39 cents a lent pound. 1932, it's down to 4%. And so by 1933, which sees the inauguration of President Franklin Roosevelt, the start of the New Deal, rural African American communities in the boot heel were still intact, but badly weakened. Their economic position eroded drastically. Uh, their hold on positions as tenant farmers weakened and they sliding back into sharecropping. The dream of land ownership is now very distant indeed. Many struggled to feed themselves or their families. And so by 1933, 1934, a whole way of life is in deep crisis. The election of Roosevelt in 32, his inauguration in 33, uh, and the subsequent New Deal did not bring better days. In fact, they brought new complications. As Southern Democrats turned New Deal legislation to suit their own interests, writing themselves checks to compensate for low crop prices, but also to invest in labor replacing machinery like tractors and begin the process of eviction. Obviously, tenant farmers and sharecroppers suffered as a result. And the way that legislation worked the Agricultural Adjustment Act. The federal government paid cotton farmers to plow up or take a portion of their land out of production, hoping to reduce supply, you increase prices. They compensated farmers for the reduction with the check. Now, a portion of that check was meant to go to the tenant farmer according to their share in the crop. But guess what? The check often got hung up in the bank account of the landowner. And the money meant to go to the sharecropper 
often ironically and cruelly goes to the tractor dealer to buy a tractor to replace the shed crop. That's how the AAA worked. And it was more or less legal. This is not illegal. They're writing the laws themselves. The Southern Tenant Farmers Union, founded in July 1934, is the first organization in the South to protest <coughs> this injustice. It's initially founded and conceived by white socialists, again, with the backing of the Socialist Party. But the union itself spreads quickly throughout the Ar Arkansas lowlands, among white tenant farmers, among African-American tenant farmers. And their main goal is to raise awareness of the plight of landless farmers amid the Depression, but importantly, the injustices of New Deal legislation. But the STFU was not the first choice of African-American farmers in the boot heel. It's another map. See, the, watch the swamps disappear. <laughs> It's amazing. Uh, you can't really see it very well from there, but these stars are STFU locals. These stars are NAACP groups. I'll talk about that in a minute. In 1932, several hundred farmers in the Boot Heel, black farmers, joined an organization called the National Federation of Colored Farmers, uh, which was committed to cooperative marketing and buying programs, again, trying to build community power in rural black. Uh, uh, families and communities to save money to buy land. Again, the, the goal is land ownership. The National Federation, led by men primarily, the same sets of ideas that had governed community building in the 1920s. The ultimate goal is land ownership. It was a lobbying group, not a protest organization. So they're working with elected officials at the state level and at the national level uh, but also trying to build these community cooperative organizations. It collapsed very quickly under the pressures of the Great Depression. It simply did not address the core problem. Others looked to the NAACP, right, founded earlier in the 20th century, forming uh, chapters in Stoddard County and New Madrid County. Um, NAACP activists looked to political solutions trying to work within the Republican Party at the time, because most African Americans voted Republican in the early 1930s. Um, but this also too quickly failed to address the crisis. And so it's only in the summer of 1936, two years after the Southern Tenant Farmers Union is founded, that the first union locals are created in Southeast Missouri, uh, near Charleston in Mississippi County. Uh, an area that will, will go on to have 13 Southern Tenant Farmers Union locals grouped in a very small area. This development is different from the National Federation of Colored Farmers, different from the NAACP, in one main way. Women lead the first organizing round. The first local outside of Charleston uh, it's organized because three women wrote to the union asking for a local. Savannah War, Elzora Bynum, and Daisy Hens. They weren't men, they were women writing to the union asking to send an organizer to help them set up a local. And this reflected changing leadership pattern in rural African American communities in the 1930s. Male-dominated ideas and groups that had relegated women to secondary roles at best, that had focused on land ownership and paternal command of family labor. Those strategies had failed to deal with the core problem of the Great Depression. Things had gotten worse under their watch. They'd gotten much worse as Farmers slid from tenancy to sharecropping. Poverty not only went up, but so did rates of disease. So in the early 1930s, the death rate from malaria in southeast Missouri goes up. The death rate from typhoid went up. This is particularly savage in diseases affecting children. Death rates 
for children under the age of two from diarrhea, right, not pleasant, skyrocketed. Right? As the people's diets weaken, their poverty increases, but their physical health starts to weaken. It's not just parents, not grandparents, but it's affecting children. Infant mortality rates rise in the 1930s in the boot heel. So 1934, African-American families experienced 190 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. And infant deaths is children under the age of one. 19% died before they reached the age of one. And that rate is going up in the early 1930s. And they're dying from nasty, nasty diseases in a nasty way. And I would argue that it's, it's this, this crisis, right? not a crisis of land ownership and imagining autonomous farms, but a crisis where you're seeing your children literally die and often in your arms that motivates women into new levels of political leadership. Right? Saying we have to seek a different set of solutions, make a different set of arguments. I would argue this is what the Southern Tenant Farmers Union makes possible. This new organization that lets women found union locals, lets them lead those union locals, provides a vehicle for them to express their concerns, their critique, of 1930s political economy, and ultimately their solutions. After all, it's women who are working in the fields, but it's also women who are bearing and raising children, often nursing them as they lay down. And again, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union had a democratic structure that allowed women to take leadership positions. It's one of the first organizations in the United States, certainly in the South, uh, particularly labor organizations that worked this way. And African American women in particular rallied to this opportunity. The union spreads quickly throughout the boot heel. It starts in Mississippi County, suddenly all the way down to the Arkansas line and spreading west. Right? Women are central to the organization. Everywhere they're organizers, they're in leadership positions. And they sharpened their demands during the 1937 Mississippi River flood, when the U.S. Corps of Engineers uh, intentionally flooded the eastern half of Mississippi County because it's a spillway to relieve the pressure on the levee at Cairo. They blasted the levee, flooding the eastern Mississippi County, and most of the STFU's membership in the boot heel are become refugees in their own home state during that flood crisis. But when they get to these refugee camps west of the uh, spillway, the, the U.S. Public Health Service, the Red Cross provide vaccinations. They provide food. They provide health checks. They provide a set of solutions that seems to match perfectly to the new crisis these families are experiencing. And the Southern Tenant Farmers uses that in, in the boot heel. The union uses that flood experience to imagine a new set of political demands on the New Deal state uh, going forward. And that is government providing access to health care, providing uh, vaccinations, providing healthy food. But these things, too, must surely be a right. right. Not just a focus on land ownership, but a focus on secure, healthy livelihoods. And they argue. If the government will provide this to a disaster it created by dynamiting the levee, shouldn't it also provide this in response to a disaster it created through its legislation? Right. They equate the two. Right. It's kind of genius, actually. And so this gives the union a new sense of purpose, a new um, critique that, that furthers its expansion. And I would say it's these demands, we have a name. list of names. I think it's important because often in the union records and the stories that are told about the union, the names that are emphasized, and you know, I'm kind of to blame. I wrote a biography of two men, right? But the names that are remembered are men's names, right? When, the, when 
they're, 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 I could provide you lists and lists of other names like this, of local activists who become union leaders, who become important political leaders in the 1930s. And it's particularly their vision, their experience, living on southern cotton farms that puts the issue of health, of secure livelihood, at the forefront of the union movement. Men are still visible, right? They're in the elected leadership positions. Owen Whitfield is the vice president of the SDFU, but his wife, Zella Whitfield, got a, this is them at their 50th wedding anniversary in 1963. Um, Zella Whitfield was just as important as Owen Whitfield was in the union. Right? She's not only farming, raising eight kids, but she's also running union locals while he's going driving off to Memphis or St. Louis to go in these kind of big wig union meetings. She's doing the hard work on the ground with the union locals, with her family, with their crops. Right? She's doing it all. In one of those meetings, we have, we have a kind of transcript of one of her speeches, she, she tells a gathering of tenant farmer women, I am the mother of nine children, she says. And during my 26 years of sharecropping and raising my family, I have had many hardships. And they would have known what she meant by hardships. Two of her children died in the early 1930s. One uh, from malaria, right? I think he was the age of seven or eight. Um, the other from pneumonia as a baby. So she had lived this health crisis, right? She, and other women, the ones she was speaking to, would know what she meant by, I have had many hardships. With this appeal, Southern Tenant Farmers Union pulls in people who had been involved in the National Federation of Colored Farmers, pulls in people who had been involved in the NAACP, and builds a broad-based social movement focused on secure, healthy livelihoods in the cotton country. No longer just land ownership. And it was this movement that designed and carried out the roadside demonstration of 1939. Through union locals that are reinforced by kinship ties, by community ties, that reach back into the early 1930s, even into the 1920s, these encampments established supply lines to families not involved in the demonstration that provided food, supplies to maintain it. They maintained discipline. They stood in the face of planter and police power that every day tried to coerce them off of the roadsides. What did they want? They were asked this repeatedly. What, what do you want? They said, not handouts but to be able to keep working toward the future as farmers. Right? That same general drive that brought them to the boot heel in the 1920s, to better themselves through hard work, as they had always tried to do, and to be able to lead healthy, sustainable livelihoods. Melvin Smith and his wife, it's important in these documents, these interviews, which are done by men, they always name the man, and then it's just in his wife. Melvin Smith and his wife, they wanted to, quote, rent or buy a farm so their family wouldn't have to move all over the country. Ike Tripp and his wife, any kind of farm job where I can make an honest support for my family. Mose and Merle Daniels, quote, to continue farming to make a living and have a place to live. Irene Nickerson, who is a woman, a leader of one of these roadside encampments, we want to work and make our own living. These were in part the demands of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, but only really as a vehicle for, for expressing the demands of a much broader rural movement. These demands had deep roots, fashioned by people committed to living on the land, whose labor had produced great wealth from the rich lowland soil. As one protester said, we feel that we are entitled to this. That is, health, life. Since we want to work, and since we are Americans, and since we help to make America what it is today. That statement reflected a long heritage of thought and action 
that came from family and community traditions as rich as the soil itself. By February 1939, state police effectively moved the demonstrations off the road, scattering, scattering the protesters across the countryside. Evictions did not stop. It's important. But many of those who were on the roadsides continued to advocate through the union. The Whitfields themselves go twice to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Roosevelt's. Zella Whitfield and Eleanor Roosevelt uh, strike an easy rapport. Their first meeting, Zella points out that they're both wearing hats with peacock feathers. Right? And this becomes an easy, this becomes a, a, a a kind of common ground for them. And in 1940, this pressure, this movement, bears fruit. The Farm Security Administration, a New Deal agency, uh, built eight model farm communities um, in southeast Missouri to house former sharecroppers, former tenant farmers who have been evicted, and to provide them not only decent houses, but garden space, access to community health organizations to allow them to transition into, into wage labor on a basis of, of, of health and secure livelihoods. Some of these communities still exist in Southeast Missouri. In addition, the Farm Security Administration created the Southeast Missouri Health Service, meant to provide universal insurance coverage and prescription medication coverage for poor families in the Boot Hill. Its initial registry in 1941 took in 4,418 families, providing them health insurance. Uh, it was hoped that this would become a model for a national universal health insurance program. That didn't happen, obviously, but the Southeast Missouri Health Service is, could be considered an early forerunner of Medicaid and Medicare. And this is all due to Southern Tenant Farmers Union members in the boot heel, many of whom were women, who turned their difficult experiences and hopes for the future into a powerful political movement that for a time commanded the attention and the action of the White House forward to your questions.